We are truly delighted this morning to have Brother Ken Hope with us. To uh, come to know Ken is to love him. He is a lovable person. He's a very kind and gentle individual and uh, epitomizes the spirit of Christ in his very demeanor. And we're thankful that he's here this morning. I think we're going to have a great day. And uh, we had a great day yesterday, three outstanding lessons toward the end of the day yesterday, as well as all the others. And we're starting off, I feel, in a wonderful manner with Brother Hope. Ken is the son-in-law of our own uh, dear Johnny Ramsey and his lovely wife, Iris. And you know right there that he's a quality person to be a part of that family. He's married to Johnny and Iris' daughter, Julie. And Ken and Julie have four children. Their oldest son is a student at Freed Hardeman University and is playing basketball there. You may or may not know, but Ken himself was uh, quite an athlete and uh, very uh, good at it. And so his son is following in his footsteps in those regards. They have three girls that are still at home. Ken is a graduate of Oklahoma Christian College. And he started preaching the gospel in 1980. And he's been with the Broadway congregation in Garland for the past 14 years. And Ken also teaches here at the Brown Trail School of Preaching. So you can see uh, from all of that that uh, he's one that we can certainly respect and admire. And we're anxious to hear him on the subject of the darkness of the watchtower and Adventism. So let's give a good hearing to Brother Ken Hope. I want you to know, brethren, that I am certainly grateful for the invitation to be with you. I've been looking forward to this opportunity to speak on this wonderful lectureship series. I'm also humbled at the very kind words that Brother Maxie Boren has spoken on my behalf. And likewise, we certainly appreciate Maxie, love him and esteem him very highly for his work's sake. I'm also convinced that this is one of the best ways to begin the day. You know, the world says the best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. Well, really, for the Christian, the best part of waking up is knowing that we're in Christ. And thus, being in Christ, our cup overflows, Psalm 23 and verse 5, with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. David said in Psalm 119, verse 147 and 148, he says, I rise before dawn, I cry for help, I wait for thy word. My eyes anticipate the night watches that I might meditate upon thy word. So there we see David rising early, going to bed late, wanting to study and meditate upon God's holy and revealed word. I want to commend you for being here. And I also want to commend the congregation here for the theme that they've chosen to explore. The light shineth in the darkness. Today, of course, we're beginning with the sub-theme, the darkness of the cults. And of course, my assignment, as you've already heard, is the darkness of the watchtower and Adventism. I'm going to say much more about that in just a moment, but as we've mentioned those three titles, you probably couldn't help but notice the term darkness. The light shineth in the darkness. The darkness of the cults the darkness of the watchtower, and Adventism. You see, our God who is light, 1 John 1 and verse 5, He's called us out of darkness into His marvelous light, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. Satan, on the other hand, wants to blind the minds of the unbelieving, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. He's in the darkness business, isn't he? Praise be to God that He sent His only begotten Son that the Christ might be the light of this world, John 8 and verse 12. How sad it is, though, as we read John 3 and verse 19, that men would love darkness rather than light, for their deeds are evil. Those who are in Christ have been delivered from the dominion of darkness, Colossians 1 and verse 13, and we are no longer to have any fellowship, any communion, any part with the unfruitful deeds of darkness, Ephesians 5 and verse 11. Those thoughts are very important as we turn our attention 
to various cults and their teaching. Now I know we live in a day in which we are overly tolerant as a society. And because of that, when anyone speaks against denominationalism, they are branded as harsh or even unloving. And when one stoops in their minds to relegate any denomination to the level of a cult, then once again they become very unloving and even are called unchristlike. Jesus prayed for unity. John 17. Denominationalism is an affront to the unity for which Jesus prayed and for which he died. Jesus spoke against division. If we're going to have the mind of Christ as we're told to have in Philippians 2 and verse 5, we also are going to have to take our stand against that which divides the body of Christ. Now, as we think about these subject matters, as we talk about cults, brethren, I don't know what to do except when something fits the definition of a cult, and when something has the characteristics of a cult, I don't know what to do except to call it a cult. Now notice the definition of a cult. Walter Martin has said a cult might be defined as a group of people gathered about a specific person or person's interpretation of the Bible. Keep that in mind. That's one of the earmarks of the groups that we're talking about today. A group that is surrounding a person or a person's interpretation of the Bible. Another man said, A cult then is any religious movement which claims, to, which claims the backing of Christ or the Bible but distorts the central message by one, an additional revelation, and two, by displacing a fundamental tenet of faith with a secondary matter. Keep that in mind. That's really what we're dealing with today. When we talk about the Watchtower Society, when we talk about Adventism, let me quickly give you some characteristics of a cult because this will be helpful for all of the studies that will be proceeding. Notice number one, those who have studied cultism, they have come up with these characteristics. They say number one, cults generally have dynamic, domineering leaders. Number two, through these leaders, cults generally offer another Jesus. Number three, cults supplant God's word with their own oracles, sacred writings, or new revelations. Number four, cults typically employ mind control, brainwashing in their conversions. Number five, cults usually offer a highly structured schedule to keep their members as busy as possible. Number six, cults often try to isolate their number from the outside world. We're talking about from family, from friends, society, jobs, and such like. Also, number seven, cults generally prey upon those who are experiencing a temporary crisis in their life. Number eight, Christ, uh, cults view non-members with suspicion and mistrust. This helps, of course, create an us-against-the-world mentality. Number nine, cults demand total commitment from their members. And number ten, cults typically employ false prophecy. These are things, again, that are characteristic of cults. When you think about the definition of cults, when you see the various characteristics of cults, then once again we are left to say that yes, the watchtower and Adventism fit that definition and have those characteristics, at least many of them. Now most of us understand that cultism is on the rise in this nation. I think the appeal behind cults is really many colored, but part of it is that a cult offers itself as a fresh new religion, one that promises for its members purpose, and also peace. Again, as we look at the increase in cultism, we need, brethren, today to take a stand, a much bolder stand. Many precious souls are being deceived by cults. 
by their leaders, by their lies, by their unfulfilled promises. And so in the language of Judges 19 and verse 30, remember what was said there at the end of that verse? Consider of it, take advice, and speak your minds. That's what we want to do this morning. To take counsel, to consider what we're looking at, and to speak up. When we talk about speaking our minds, we're talking really about speaking as the oracles of God. Because that's what really matters. Now let me say this, and again I say this in an apologetic fashion. When I was given the assignment, originally we were told to look at the watchtower and then to take a look at Adventism. And I think our manuscript bears that out due to the brevity of the section on Adventism. But as we turn our attention to this presentation, I'm specifically going to deal with the watchtower. I've wrestled with this and tried to figure out what to do, but the time that is permitted, if I was going to try to deal with both, then once again, we really wouldn't cover either as we should. Uh, this is just another reason why you need to buy the book. I was told to put that plug in, and so there it is. No, seriously, I was not told to, but this is another reason why you do need to buy the book. But as we turn our attention to the watchtower, those that we're referring to when we refer to the watchtower are those that call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. Really, a better designation for them would be watchtower witnesses. They are not Jehovah's Witnesses. But more about that in a moment. This group had its beginning, the foundation was laid by Charles Taze Russell. He is not the founder of this group, but he is known as the organizer of it. And when you go back and look at history regarding this man, this man was as carnal as he was colorful. History reveals this. I'm not being unkind when I say these things because these things are documented. This man went to trial for what was called miracle wheat, evidently selling it at an exaggerated price. In 1913, his wife filed grounds for divorce against him on four counts, the most serious being the charge of adultery. There was a certain woman by the name of Rose Ball who was involved. And at first, Russell denied the charge. Later, he confessed that he was indeed an adulterer. When he died in 1916, a man by the name of Joseph F. Rutherford took his place. He's called Judge Rutherford. This man not only took over for him in leadership of that group, but he also followed him in his marital infidelity. Rutherford was a more private man than Russell, and so he kept this thing under wraps. But again, that's what happened. That's what history tells us. Also, in one of the books that he has written, in 1920, he wrote a book entitled, Millions Now Living Will Never Die. That book is now out of print. It will not be reprinted. And the reason is very simple. He makes several prophecies in that book that never come to fruition. They are never fulfilled because he is in fact a false prophet. Time has always been hard on false prophets. In Deuteronomy 18 verses 21 through 22, we find out that when a man speaks something in the name of the Lord, if that doesn't come to pass, that is what the Lord has not spoken. And you might look at the book because you'll find out what the Lord has not spoken. One of the things that he said was that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would come back to this earth. That they would be seen visibly. That they would begin a new order that many of the Old Testament worthies in Hebrews 11 would also accompany them. He also stated that men who were 70 years of age would slowly, gradually go back to the days of their youth and that they would live forever on this earth and would never die. Now I ask you, which of those have happened? Neither. Rutherford, by that assertion, proves himself again to be a false prophet. 
But by his urging, in 1931, this group adopted the name Jehovah's Witnesses. It's from Isaiah 43 and verse 10. Remember there, God says that you shall be my witnesses, saith Jehovah. Now again, they have as much right to claim that designation as the false teachers in Corinth in the first century had a right to lay hold of the term apostle. Remember what Paul said about them? 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 13. He says that they are false apostles. They are deceitful workers. I speak these things in love, but when you look at what they teach, it becomes obvious concerning this group that they are indeed teaching error, teaching falsehoods. I want us to consider some of those falsehoods while time permits. We're going to be noticing the Godhead, what the Watchtower Witnesses say concerning the Godhead, concerning Christ, concerning the Holy Spirit, concerning the Bible, concerning man, his nature, concerning hell, and also concerning our Lord's return. Time will probably not permit us to watch and look into all of those. But again, the book gives us some information regarding each one of these topics. Let's, though, begin by looking at what the Watchtower witnesses say about the Godhead. Now, you and I understand that the Bible teaches that the Godhead is comprised of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. This concept, this truth, this reality is scoffed at by the Watchtower Witnesses. They deny this vehemently. They say that only God the Father is the divine eternal being, that Christ was nothing more than a created being, and that the Holy Spirit is nothing more than an impersonal force of God. More about those two later. But again, they deny what the Bible teaches concerning the triune Godhead. Let me read one of their quotes concerning this, and I think this will help us to understand where they're coming from. In one of their works, Make Sure of All Things, it declares this regarding the doctrine of the Trinity, as it says, that it is, quote, a false, unbiblical doctrine. In another work, Let God Be True, it says this, The doctrine of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is from Satan. Now notice that. You're going to find out that many of the things the Bible teaches, the Watchtower Witnesses say in essence, this is from Satan. They do that a lot. About the deity of Christ, they say this is from Satan. About the Godhead, they say this is from Satan. About the fact that man has an immortal soul or spirit, they say this is from Satan. They just take what the Bible says and ignore it, discard it, reject it, and then say that this is from our adversary, our enemy, Satan. How sad. Rutherford, in a book, Reconciliation, he states this, Never was there a more deceptive doctrine advanced than that of the Trinity. It could have originated only in one mind, and that the mind of Satan, the devil. One of the proofs that they choose to acknowledge, to explore, is in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. And I'm going to ask you to turn to this passage. You're probably familiar with it, Moses standing before Israel. And notice what we read in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Moses says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord our God is one Lord. They fix their attention upon this verse and they say this excludes a plurality of persons in the Godhead because it says one Lord. Now they also go on to teach in other places that those who preach and teach the triune Godhead, the Trinity, that we are teaching that there are three gods in one. I do not teach that there are three gods in one. I've never heard anybody teach that there are three gods in one but that there is one God or one Godhead, and within that Godhead there are three distinct persons. That's what the Bible teaches, not that there are three gods in one. But notice something interesting about this passage. 
Literally, we could read it as follows. Jehovah, our gods, plural, because this is Elohim, plural. Jehovah, our gods, is Jehovah a unity? Now, we read it like that because it could be read in this fashion because of the Hebrew. Again, Jehovah, our gods, Elohim. Remember in Genesis 1 and verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? That's Elohim, a plurality. In the very same chapter, in Genesis 1 and verse 26, Jehovah himself will speak, and notice what he says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Plurality. Again, of course, as the Bible is revealed and has been revealed as we get to the New Testament, we begin to see distinctly the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We begin to understand why Elohim would be used. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And of course, the Hebrew word for one is ekah. Again, the verse literally, Jehovah our gods, is Jehovah a unity. This word can mean a composite unity. It can imply a unity with the plurality of persons. That's important because in Genesis 2 and verse 24, regarding the husband and the wife, when God presents Eve before Adam and he says, This is not bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken from man. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. A unity. That's what the Bible teaches. Also in Matthew 19 and verse 5. In Numbers 13 and verse 23, we read about many grapes, but they're called one cluster. A unity. In John 17, verses 20 and 21, all believers are to be one. And so in that reference, in that venue, we see how God, our Father, is one. One. God the Father, God the Son, God the Christ. And doesn't the Bible teach us that? In Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17, at the baptism of Jesus, what do we see? We see the Christ having assumed his fleshly form, but the Son of God and the Son of Man. But we see Jesus, we see the Spirit descending in the form of a dove, and we hear the voice of the Father saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. That context is pretty plain. In Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, we're told to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 14, we see again the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in that context, something beautiful is revealed. We are chosen of the Father. We are redeemed by the Son. And we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In view of man's salvation, you can't find a more composite picture. But again, the Watchtower Society denies this. They deny the triune Godhead. That's not all. They also deny the deity of Jesus. I want us to look somewhat at this very quickly. Again, they do not teach that Jesus is divine, that He is God. Let me read you a couple of their quotes. They state, Rutherford in Reconciliation, he says, The great Jehovah is the God. The Son, the Logos, is a God. The name God is applied to mighty ones, even to angels and magistrates. The name God is applied, or therefore properly applied, to the Son because He is a mighty one. The names Jehovah, Almighty God, and Most High are never in the Scripture applied to Jesus, the Son of God. In truth, when Jesus was on earth, He was a perfect man, nothing more, nothing less. Jesus was not God the Son. And then in a book mistitled, the title of it is Good News to Make You Happy, but then they wrest the deity from Christ. That doesn't make anyone happy. 
But again, they say Jesus was not half God, half man. He was not God in the flesh. To atone for one man's, Adam's, trespass, the one man, Jesus Christ, had to correspond exactly to the one perfect Adam. He had to be a perfect man, nothing more, nothing less. There you have it from their own mouths. That's all Jesus was, is, a perfect man. No deity. Their arguments are many. We don't have time to even cover all of their arguments. But one that's real interesting, turn sometime today and begin reading in Proverbs 8, beginning in verse 22, and read through the rest of that chapter. And there, they want to go to this context and say, this is speaking of Jesus. And it talks about one who is with God at the beginning, helped God in the creation, and so on and so forth. But if you'll read that context and be honest with it, that has nothing whatsoever to do with Jesus, the Christ. It has everything to do with a poetic personification of wisdom. That's what's going on in Proverbs 8. Wisdom is calling in the streets in verse 1. And wisdom is going to be personified as if given human features as you go out through that context. Remember in Proverbs 1 and verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In Proverbs 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs, the proverbial parents, are teaching the children in Proverbs 4 and verse 5, get wisdom. And then in Proverbs 4 and verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing. Throughout this, we're seeing urging to acquire wisdom. And in Proverbs 8, no, that's not a picture of Jesus. It is a poetic personification of wisdom. Read the context. Let's be honest with it. There's another argument that they use in John 14 and verse 28. Here Jesus makes a statement, for the Father is greater than I. Of course, what they readily respond with is that if he was deity, he would be equal with the Father. But by his own words, he says, the Father is greater than I. Jesus is speaking with reference to his physical state. Remember, Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant. Philippians 2 and verse 7. Concerning his divinity, he was equal with God, but concerning his humanity, from which he speaks at that venture, he is human. And so, yes, he does say, and yes, it is right in that context, that the Father is greater than I. One thing that the Jehovah Witnesses do, and you're probably all familiar with this, but still I'll ask you to turn to John, the first chapter, in their own biased translation of the Scriptures, the New World Translation, they come to John, the first chapter, and in the very first verse, they once again begin their desecration of the inspired text. Read this with me. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God, of course, is Theos. The first time we read God in this passage, it is preceded by the definite article. The next time we read it in this verse, it is without the definite article. Therefore, the Jehovah Witnesses say, we have a right now to put in there that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. You know what's interesting about that, even in view of their own translation? Throughout the first chapter, you're going to find Theos without the definite article. In verse 6, in verse 12, in verse 13, in verse 18, in every one of those contexts without the definite article, yet they do not even translate it as they have in verse 1. There is a prejudice here. There is a bias concerning Christ Jesus our Lord. But don't ever forget Notice the book that begins, and the word was God. Notice now, turn with me to John 20 and verse 28, and I want us to read together what Thomas says. Because the book that opens with the affirmation that the word was God, it closes with the marvelous words of Thomas. 
when Thomas looking at the Christ, notice what he says in verse 28, my Lord and my God. A literal translation of this would read, the Lord of me and the God of me. Thomas was right. Notice Jesus did not rebuke Thomas. If Thomas was wrong, Jesus would have rebuked him. But Thomas was right. In Colossians 1 and verse 15, here you have another one of their arguments where it says the firstborn of every creature. And of course what they will do with that, they'll try to press that Jesus was the first thing created. They'll do likewise with Revelation 3 and verse 14, the beginning of the creation of God. But regarding the firstborn of every creature, let's notice something very quickly. Firstborn is used throughout the Bible in reference to time, meaning the first one born, and it's also used in reference to rank or position and preeminence. The firstborn also had rank, had position, had preeminence. If you go back and look closely at, at Exodus, the fourth chapter, verses 22 and 23, you'll see how it's used in both cases. God says, I want you to let my son Israel go. Israel's my firstborn. Firstborn in the sense of rank and position and preeminence. But then God also says, if you will not let my firstborn go, I will slay your son, speaking to the Pharaoh, your firstborn. In reference to time. I want you to do something very interesting. Now turn with me to Psalm 89. And here is just one verse that really answers the heresy of what they're teaching from Colossians 1 and verse 15. In Psalm 89, God is speaking about David. And I want you to notice what he says in verse 27. He says, Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. Notice this. And I will make him, who? David, my firstborn. Well, is God saying He's going to be the first king ever made? It can't be. It can't be, can it? But the text goes on to explain what is meant by the firstborn. This is in view of rank, of position, of preeminence. I will make Him my firstborn, now catch this, higher than the kings of the earth. David would be firstborn in view of all the kings because he would be higher in rank, in position, in preeminence. Colossians 1 and verse 18 settles the issue. He's to have preeminence in all things. Colossians 1 is not teaching that Jesus is the first thing created, but that He is firstborn in the sense of position, rank. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 19, 16. I mentioned Revelation 3 and verse 14 where Jesus describes Himself as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Again, they jump on that phrase, the beginning of the creation of God, meaning to them that once again He was the first thing created. And then through Him God created everything else. The word there, Archi, is the word from which we get architect. And that's really a pretty good observation of what's happening in Revelation 3. Look at the church at Laodicea. They thought that they, through the mundane things of this world, could become rich, wealthy, and were in need of nothing. But the creator of the entire universe, Jesus Christ, and that's what the word Arche is emphasizing there, He's the source, He's the origin of creation. Jesus is saying, if you want to become rich, if you want to become wealthy, if you really want to stand in need of nothing, then you have to buy from me, he'll say, the Creator, everything that you need. The sad thing in and the sad, sad thing about Revelation 3 is remember Jesus was standing at the door and knocking. Those who claimed to have everything didn't have the one that they needed most, the Christ. They had pushed him aside, they'd locked him out. But he still in love and compassion says, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. No, the Bible 
teaches emphatically that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He is deity. He is divine. Remember Isaiah 7 and verse 14 coupled with Matthew 1 and verse 23? We read about Him and He is Emmanuel, which being translated means what? God with us. That's what the Bible teaches. God with us. In three verses in the book of Isaiah, I want to note these because I want you to go back and look at them. This forms a very convincing argument for the deity of our Lord. In Isaiah 41 and verse 4, and Isaiah 44 and verse 6, and Isaiah 48 and verse 12, Jehovah, Jehovah Himself, even the Jehovah Witnesses would say, yes, this is Jehovah speaking in that context, but Jehovah will say, I am the first and the last. And do you know what happens in Revelation 1, 17 and 18? Jesus applies that terminology to Himself. Why? How? Because He is deity. Because He is the first and the last. You see, really, the Jehovah Witnesses had the same problems that the Jews had when they listened to Jesus. In John 5... And verse 18, remember what the Jews said? This man is making himself equal with God. That's what the Jehovah Witnesses are saying. We don't like this. This man is making himself equal with God. Why was Jesus crucified by the Jews? Because of blasphemy. Listen to John 10 and verse 33. Because thou being man, makest thyself God. That's exactly what Jesus did because that's exactly who he was. And so the Jehovah Witnesses, the Watchtower Witnesses, have the same problem the Jews in the first century had. They don't like it. Because here's one who's presenting himself, making himself equal with God. Do you know why Jesus did that? Because he was. God with us. It's sad, but some today, as we think about this cult, some today are crucifying afresh the Son of God, bringing him to an open shame. I'm looking at the time here. Maxie told me, please keep an eye on it. We're going to have time to deal with one more of these fallacies concerning the Holy Spirit. And I want to read to you what they say concerning the Holy Spirit. Again, just as they deny the deity of Jesus, they deny the deity of the Holy Spirit. Here's what they say. Rutherford in Reconciliation says the Holy Spirit is not a person and is therefore not one of the gods of the Trinity. When you read and study the Bible, let me tell you something, and we know this. The Holy Spirit is set forth as a person, as a personage. We know that because of the masculine gender that He is given. In John 14, verses 16 and 17, and verse 26, Jesus will three times speak of the Holy Spirit and refer to Him as He. And three more times speak of the Holy Spirit and refer to Him as Him. He is a person. Language tells us that. Now let me read you a quote from Brother Jerry Moffat. A very, very insightful quote at that. Notice what Jerry Moffat says. On this issue, we often say the Holy Spirit is a person because masculine pronouns such as He and Him are used to refer to Him. But they argue that this does not prove he's a person, for the antecedent to the pronoun, such as comforter or helper, is masculine in the Greek text, and so the pronoun must be masculine to agree grammatically. However, this argument will not hold up under investigation. In John 16, 13, the neuter spirit is used, and a neuter pronoun is required to agree with it. But John, evidently to show the Holy Spirit is a person, uses the masculine singular form, Actually, John violates Greek grammar, going out of his way to show that the Holy Spirit should be thought of as a personage. He only has to do that once for us to get the truth. So the, so the Spirit is called He, for He is a person, though not a human person. Think about that. The language used. But you know what? The actions ascribed to the Holy Spirit also imply personage. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10, he searches. 
In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11, he knows. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13, he teaches. In Revelation 2 and verse 7, he speaks. In Romans 8 and verse 27, he intercedes. Do you know what? In Acts 5 and verse 3, he can be lied to. In Ephesians 4 and verse 30, he can be grieved. That's what the Bible teaches. In Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32, he can be blasphemed. Know the language employed and the actions that we see. Make us understand that the Holy Spirit is a person. And let me leave you with this. In Acts, the fifth chapter, look at this context closely. In verse 3, Ananias and Sapphira, they're told that they've lied against the Holy Spirit. But then in verse 4, they've to they're told that they haven't lied to men, but to God. How can such be? Except that once again, the Holy Spirit is God. That's exactly what the Bible teaches. As we said earlier, 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14, Let the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. As we think about the witnesses, the watchtower witnesses, keep this in mind. Jeremiah 23 and verse 21. God says, I haven't sent these prophets, but they ran. I haven't spoken to them, but they prophesied. David said in Psalm 119 and verse 104, Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. God give us the courage to boldly take our stand against these cults that are deceiving many precious souls.